Springs Church. Uh, just a few things. I'm doing the welcome, which is unusual. Dave trusted me with it, probably a mistake, but we're going to try to get through this. But no, we're glad that you're here. Uh, whether you're watching in, in the room or online, uh, if you have never fi uh, filled out a Connect card, we ask that you do that. We have that available online, and we have it in the room. If you want to look on your bulletin, there is a QR code on the inside. You can scan that and fill out that information. Okay, so a few quick things to go over. Uh, we have Connect Group signups. They are open right now. If you're not in a Connect Group, uh, we want you in one. And Liz Skelton is the head of that. I don't know where Liz is. There she is. Just wave her arm. You can find her. Thank you, Liz. You can find her after church, and uh, she'd be more than happy to talk to you about that. And uh, there's a form you can fill out to sign up for that. <clears throat> Uh, we have a new adult Wednesday night Bible class this week. Dave is teaching that. It's over judges. It's going to be awesome. Dave is a great teacher, which is probably not a huge shock since you're used to listening to him uh, talk to us every Sunday. Uh, and Caleb, student signups for the spring retreat. Uh, if you have, is that, what grades is that? Sixth through twelfth grade. So you definitely want to sign up for that. You don't want to miss out. And uh, to keep up with all the uh, updates and everything we have going on, you don't want to trust me for it, download the app. Download the app and you'll get all the information you need uh, for that. And let's see, anything else? Dave, what did you have here? I read this and now I can't remember. We definitely want you to join us for Easter. This is why you didn't want me doing this. Join us for Easter. We have two services on Easter. It's going to be at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. So make one of them and uh, invite a friend. Um, let's see. Oh, invite cards. There we go. Make sure you grab an invite card. This is what it looks like. I'm aware that you can't see it, but you can roughly see the shape of it. Find those out there. Grab them and hand them out to your friends. Leave them at a restaurant, wherever you're at, because we want people to show up. Uh, I think that's, that's just about going to do it for me. We're going to get started uh, for worship. So if you want to stand with us, and we'll, we'll get started this morning.
Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Were you doing good? Good, good. I'm so excited because I get to share some communion thoughts with you. So I have to know how many of you like to get gifts? Okay, y'all must all be givers. I love to get gifts, just so you know. If you're givers, I love it. No, who likes to get gifts? I love to get a good gift. Um, I'm a, I tend to keep gifts that are given to me. I'm a bit of pack rat that way. If you've ever been to my office, you will see stuff that I have been given from kids, from family. I mean, it's a lot. I have all my, my shelves are full. But the reason for that is I can look at something that somebody has given me, and I can go back to that time whenever I received it. I can relive that memory of whenever it was given to me. I have some very special memories that are attached to gifts that have been given to me. Um, I have my favorite gift as a child was this little bitty white kitten with a beautiful red bow tied around her neck. Um, it was my favorite Christmas ever. A snowball came running out of my parents' bedroom at me. Like, I will remember that forever. Sadly, I no longer have a snowball. Not in my office either. Um, <laughs> She's not there. But another more recent one, a few years ago, I had a fourth grade girl in my ministry who knew that my dad had just passed away, and she wanted to pray with me. She had come up to me, and she said, Miss Amber, can I please pray with you? I know you're sad. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm not wearing it as well as I thought I was, but yes, let's pray. So she prayed this sweet prayer. It was so beautiful. And we get done, and I, she gave me a hug, and I think she felt a little awkward because she was like, Miss Amber, I'm going to give you this. I am not joking. I do not know what this is. I think it's a little, I think it's a cake. It's supposed to be cake. I don't know. But it's this cute little thing that she gave me at that moment. And I think it was just, she felt a little awkward. I don't know what it was. But I have kept this, and it stays in my office. Um, but I have kept this because of that special memory that I had with that little girl that was willing to take time out of that busy Sunday morning because she felt led to pray with me. So, I will keep this forever. Um, gifts can remind us of where we were when we received them. Communion reminds us of where we were when we met Jesus. Um, it reminds us of the gift of salvation. No gift can outmeasure the weight, the importance, and the sacrifice of Jesus' death on the cross. As we take communion this morning, remember when you received God's gift. Remember where you were when you asked Jesus into your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the gift of Jesus. Lord, as we partake in communion this morning, we, may we remember you and the sacrifice that you made for us because of your love. In Jesus' name, amen.
chance to take a communion, just ask that whenever you're ready, you can just stand up and continue to worship with us. And no longer I who live, but Christ in me, for I've been born. Let's declare this today. The enemy 
thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine. The enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said you are mine. Today we're so thankful that you will pick us up and put us back together and make us whole with you. Thank you. All these pieces broken and scattered Mercy gathered, mended and told. Empty handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free. I've been set free. Amazing grace, how sweet.
learned that to get it to work, you blow in the cartridge. We went into the dungeons and like fought skeletons and stuff <laughs> in the pixelated, it was, yeah, my dad still plays it. And you shove it in and you have to like barely push it in just right, just to get, just to get it perfect so it'll run. We probably need to come on with it. We need to play Station 5 nowadays. <laughs> so typically, people's first Nintendo was the combo Super Mario Brothers Duck Hunt. My mom must have thought that Mario and Luigi were going to be a bad influence on me. So my first Nintendo game was called Exodus. You were Moses, and you had to help the Israelites make it to the promised land. To end a level, you had to answer Bible trivia questions. So, I lost a lot of friends because of that game. And that's a true, that is a true story. Movies, um, oh my gosh, Tombstone. Val Kilmer saying, I'm your Huckleberry. <laughs> this is one of the best movie lines ever. I mean, Major League, Major League Two, not Major League Three. Definitely Clueless. My mom went to Blockbuster, one of my favorite places. And rented clues for me. For the Ninja Turtles movies, um, I, just, I just remember like consistently watching it on VHS, uh, which for the young people is a thing. Mm -hmm. My Python. That brave part. Greatest movie of all time. It's so good. I really thought I could pull off wearing the kilt. All the Meg Ryan movies. For our goofy movie, um, Lion King. Titanic. I mean, you can't talk about the 90s without talking about Titanic. So, late 90s, original must-see TV, Friends, ER, Seinfeld. Still quote Seinfeld, probably, maybe on a daily basis. Oh, Growing Pains. I loved that one. Of course, TGIF was a big deal. You, you had it all, like, Full House. Family Matters was a big one. Hey, it's TGIF, but they get to the living room, make sure dinner's over with so you can, you know, watch her home. Then I be like, I mean, who doesn't love the Fresh Prince of Bel Air? In West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playgrounds where I spent most of my days. Chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool, and shooting some b ball outside of the school when a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble in the neighborhood. Saturday Night Live. Who had, you know, Adam Sandler, David Spade, Chris Farley. Hans and Franz were there to bomb oh, you up. It living in a van down by the river! Great 90s TV show. I remember not getting to watch The Simpsons. Thanks, Mom. I love 90s. All right, so mid 90s, I think, was when Lion King came out. Now fast forward like 15 years, I have my own actual child, and I'm holding her like Simba. Like, oh, Simba! So, so much footage. Um, Man, that's been a lot of fun. This has been a great series. We've had a ton of fun. Hey, good morning. Welcome. My name's Dave, if you don't know. Uh, if you're new here, welcome. You are coming in on the final week of I Love the 90s, so you have missed a lot, right? Um, but don't worry. You can go back and relive all the greatest hits of the 90s and of the last three weeks on the website and our app. Uh, go and catch up. But we've been talking all about progress. The 90s were the decade of progress. And so and we talked and we started out kind of looking at technology and how, what, you know, how Apple kind of took off and how that's applicable to us and our spiritual journey as well. How we can actually begin, you know, what's the process, what's the key to making progress in our lives. And, and we talked a little bit about that. And we've, we've talked about all kinds of stuff, fun stuff in this series. We've talked about fashion. We've talked about movies and TV and all the things. Now today, we're going to start with one of my favorite things from the 90s. Math. Right, the collective groan goes over the crowd, right? Do you remember when you, when you first got into like algebra and stuff? That was in the 90s for me. And the teacher wrote something like this on the board. And some of you freaked out immediately, right? Why is English invading math? Somebody put letters in my numbers and it makes no sense whatsoever. Now there's a few of us out there that look at that and know exactly what the answer is. 
there's others who maybe go through some steps, right? You got divide by two, and that cancels the two, and x equals three. Now, that's a pretty basic formula, right? Some of you are like, no, it's not. That's advanced. Like, that's college-level stuff right there. And I get that. I do. But here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to try and give you some easy formulas today, some formulas for growth. Because the reality is, if we're going to make progress, we've said it from the very beginning, Peter's final words, his mic drop words at the end of 2 Peter was, I want you to grow. Grow in grace, grow in the knowledge of our Lord. And so how do we grow? Right? So I'm going to give you a couple of formulas today, a couple of things we can do to help us grow. So here's the first formula. Right? The first formula is that passive... Does not equal, some of you have to remember, that little line through it means does not equal, right? Passive does not equal progress, right? Just sitting back, just, just waiting isn't going to get you where you want to get to in life. If I was to say, hey, who here would like to lose a few pounds, right? You look, yeah, some hands shot up, mine's up, right? We all want to lose a few, want to be a little healthier. You know what doesn't get us there? If I just look in the mirror every day and say, man... Pounds go away. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Or if I walk by the mirror, I'm like, man, I, I probably need a little. Somebody should do something about that. And then I go eat breakfast, right? And I don't get the four-count chicken mini. I get the ten-count chicken mini, right? Caleb's preaching over there, right? That's good stuff right there, right? But it doesn't just happen if we sit back and do nothing. If we're passive, we don't make the progress that we want. Think about financially, right? All of us would like to have a little bit more money in savings. How many people? More money at the, in savings at the end of this year than last year. If your hand's not up, you're one of two people. You're either grumpy and not playing along, but this is an all-skate, so everybody needs to play, <laughs> right? Or you're rich, and we want to hang out with you, right? <laughs> and don't forget to tithe. Um, but, yeah, but listen, we all want more money. How many of us are willing to... Tighten down that budget a little bit. Get that second job. Do the things we need to do to grow and to make progress. If we're passive, these things don't happen. The same is true for our spiritual journey. Right? No matter who you are, no matter where you're at in your spiritual journey, you have next steps. You have something in front of you. There is a next challenge. There is a next step. There is something God is calling you, challenging you, asking you to do to grow in your knowledge of him, to grow in your relationship with him. But if we never take that step, if we remain passive, we never get to experience what, it, what he has planned for us. We've got to refuse to be passive, so it looks like the second equation, right? That proactive equals progress. That we've got to be proactive. We've got to go on the offensive. We've got to go on the attack. I say it all the time to young men who look at me, and then they look at my wife, and they're like, how did that happen? Because I wasn't passive, right? I remember the day I saw her, right? And I decided today's the day, right? This is the day the Lord has made. I will go and outkick my coverage, right? I will go and pursue. Say, ask somebody that knows football to explain that to you later, right? But I didn't just sit back, right? If you're single right now and you're thinking, man, God, would you just please send me the love of my life? But you never leave your house? Like, unless you're marrying the FedEx man, that's not going to work. <laughs> right? Now, he may be cute and that may be the guy for you. I don't know. But you've got to be proactive. We've got to get out and do. We've got to become mobile and active in how we pursue the things. Whether it's physically or relationally or financially or spiritually. Right, because Satan's working against us too. Satan's got his own formulas, right? Satan has this formula where, listen, if I can make you anxious or stressed or worried or overwhelmed, that's going to make you passive, and passive doesn't equal progress. Right, if I can just lock you down, if I can just get you where you're not moving, you're not doing anything, then he wins. So we can't buy into that. We can't allow Satan to do that. So with all that in mind, we're going to talk about Paul today. Now, Paul is one of those characters, and if you're around here very much, you've heard me talk about Paul. But if you're new, right, Paul didn't like Christians when he started. Matter of fact, he hated Christians until he met Jesus. And in Acts 6, 7, 8, 9, 
Paul's hunting down Christians, and then he encounters Jesus, and all of a sudden he goes from hating Christians and trying to imprison and kill Christians to he becomes the leader of the Christians, which just validates everything we talk about around here, that you can't meet Jesus and stay the same. Right? If you encounter him, he's going to change you. There's something that's going to happen, and you're going to grow and change in life. And you say, well, Dave, listen, that's, that sounds good, but this is, this is just the way I am. No, no, no. That may be the way you are, but it's not who Jesus created you to be. It's not who God designed you to be. When we meet him, when we encounter Jesus, it changes us. And Paul learned a lesson in his encounter, in his growth, in his progress. He learned a lesson that I hope you and I learn today as well. Right? And the lesson is this, that any time we want to make progress, we will face opposition. Right? And that's true in every area of life. You don't even have to believe in Jesus for this statement to be true. Anything you're trying to do in life, when you commit to doing it, when you decide that you're going to make progress, you're going to face opposition. You know how I know? It happened to me just a couple of weeks ago. Right before spring break, decided, hey, you know what? I am going to lose a few pounds. We're going to get healthy, right? The staff, some of the preschool teachers, we all decide, hey, let's get healthy. Let's do some things. Weather's turning nice. Let's get better. I just killed it that first week. And then on spring break, some of my friends, and I call them friends now, but by the end of the story, not so much, right? Decide, hey, let's go eat at Pops. If you don't know, Pops is a really cool place, lots of good food, everything. I do pretty good, right? Eat a burger, don't overindulge in anything, right? Don't buy a bunch of candy, all that. Go to get our bill at the end of the night, and the waiter comes, and he says, hey, did you guys save room for dessert? And me, in all my spiritual Holy Spirit willpower, said, no, I do not want dessert. And he said, yeah, but you guys have been great. So I'm going to bring you some dessert for free. <laughs> all right, Satan, I, I hear you. I see what you're doing, right? But I'm not too worried about it because there's like 10 of us, and he's going to bring out this little cake or a little bowl of ice cream. The vultures are going to devour it. I'll just sit back and not lose a finger, and we'll be good. This is what he brought to the table. And that's after the vultures devoured half of it. Now, what you can't tell is this little creation right here may be the greatest strawberry shortcake ice cream something that I've ever had in my life. But that's what happens, right? Like you make a decision, you plan on making progress, and then boom, something gets in your way. It's the same with money. You make a decision, hey, we as a family, we're going to save money, we're going to work hard, we're going to budget, and then the next day, something breaks down, or something goes on sale, or, right? And, and it just happens, and we can't get past it. The same true spiritually. You make a commitment, today's the day, I'm going to follow God, I'm gonna, life is going to be better because I'm going to pursue Him, and then all of a sudden, one temptation, one obstacle after another, you're going to face opposition. But Paul... Paul faced opposition unlike anything you or I see. Hey, Paul's story goes, and you get to Acts 20, 21, 22, and Paul is so hated by the people, the religious leaders and the other people that hated Christianity, that he walks into the temple one day and a riot breaks out. Now, I've been in a lot of places. I've never started a riot before, right? But that's how much they hated him. And so they arrest him and they throw him in prison, all because he was preaching the gospel. Story picks up in Acts chapter 23. It says, The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath to not eat or drink until they had killed Paul. Now, listen, I've been mad before. I mean, there's a day where I was so mad that I would throw things, there's been a day that I was so mad I would yell. There's even been a day that was so mad that I'd take a swing at you. Right, And some of you have too, and it was just at your kids on the way to church this morning. I get it. right? It's hard. It's hard getting them here. But I have never been so mad that I swore I wouldn't eat until I killed somebody. Because listen, if that ever happens, you're dead by dinner, because I'm going to eat. Right? Like, there's, like these guys are crazy mad. Like, we're not, we're not going to eat, we're not going to drink until we kill it. And a little sidebar, like, we're having some fun, a little sidebar. This is free. You don't, we don't charge extra for this. Isn't that what happens? Right? When we get angry, don't we do things and say things that end up hurting ourselves? 
far more than they hurt others. That's what they did. Hey, we're going to starve. We're not going to eat because we're mad at Paul. The story goes on. More than 40 men. Somebody's a good salesman to convince 40 men to not eat or drink all day. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and they said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything. I guess they added drinking back in because you've got to be a little drunk to have that kind of an idea. Uh, until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. They have set an ambush, right? They have set a trap. Hey, we're going to say we just want to talk to him, but when he gets here, that's when we'll kill him. That's when we're going to go. And what's happened is they're falling in to the other formula that Satan has, right? It's two words. It's deception and destruction, right? That's what Satan does. He deceives us so that he can destroy us. There's always a lie. There's always something that we buy into. There's always something that we begin to believe but when we believe something that's not truth, it always leads to destruction. That's the way it always works. You think about it. The, the, there's been times in your life, you know examples in which we, we've so deceived ourselves to think we're doing the right thing. But it leads to destruction. Think about uh, flying, right? Uh, there's all these stories of, of pilots who, who have this you know, spatial disorientation where they're in clouds or they're in fog and they think they're, they think they're rising and actually they're plummeting, right? They're convinced they're doing the right thing, but it leads to destruction. You think of radical religious groups that turn into terrorism. They believe, they have bought into, they are fully convinced that what they are doing is right, do you understand the depths of deception that convince you that you've got to murder, you've got to take lives? And yet we do the same thing. We buy into the lies. And that's why you still carry around that shame or that regret or that guilt. So you've been so deceived to believe that that's who you are, that that's part of you, that that defines you. And when we stay there, when we hold on to that, it only leads to destruction. You say, ah, one of the ways we decide, deceive ourselves, we say, well, it's, listen, it's just one time. It's not going to hurt anything. But one time never stops at one time. It always leads to destruction. I, it won't hurt anybody else. It's only going to affect me. But it never just affects you. See, Satan deceives us. He tries to trick us into believing something is right. And when we believe something that's not true, it always leads to destruction. Now, can we be real honest in church this morning? You know what the number one deception in churches all across America is? Somebody else will do it. All right? So you got tense in here. Because like, we've all thought that, and we've all chose to believe that from time to time. Somebody else will serve. Somebody else will give. Somebody else will support that. Somebody else will volunteer. Right? And we believe that. We believe that somebody else will do it. And you know what happens when a church begins to believe the lie that somebody else will do it? That church dies. See, churches don't die just because pastors screw up. Churches don't die because of pandemics. Churches die when people decide that somebody else will do it. When they believe the deception, when they believe the lie, it always leads to destruction. So we can't believe that lie, that somebody else will do it. And listen, one more, just on a side note, just because something's popular doesn't mean it's true. Right? Just because something is common in a culture, common in a society, doesn't mean it's right. Mullets have been popular twice. Tell me how that happened. <laughs> right? It's still not right. Young men, you will never date my daughter if you have a mullet. Knock it off. Right? That is, that is not right. I don't care how popular it is. See, churches weren't meant to be popular. They weren't meant to be, they're meant to believe in truth. And when we follow truth, we leave away from destruction. And you know that, right? Because we all have them. 
We all have family and friends who don't know Jesus. We all have family and friends who aren't following actively in a relationship with God. But you've got to make a choice. Will you be passive or will you be proactive? Are you going to sit back and watch or are you going to do something about it? Because the deception is, well, they don't want me in their business. It, I, don't, I don't need to stick my nose in where it doesn't belong. But if we do, their trajectory is going to continue to lead in the path of destruction. Are you going to be passive? Or are you going to be proactive? And before anybody gets self-righteous and says, oh, I'm never passive. Yes, you are. Because we all have remote controls. And you know what you do when the remote control battery dies? You press the buttons harder. So you don't change the battery. You think, I'm going to just, right? Some of you, that's real right there. Some of you are thinking, I did that this morning, right? But pressing the button harder is not proactive. Changing the batteries. We've got to choose to be proactive. The story goes on. It says, but when... The son of Paul's sister, we don't even know who this kid is, right? No name kid. Son of Paul's sister heard the plot. He went into the barracks and he told Paul. I love this. This kid who we don't know his name is is recorded in history purely because he was in the right place at the right time, right? Don't you love being in the right place at the right time? I do. I was in the right place at the right time the other day. I was in the Chick-fil-A drive-thru. I love talking about Chick-fil-A on Sundays because you can't go get it. So you're going to think about it for 24 hours. Right, But I was in the drive-thru, I get to the window, the girl at the window says, hey, your meal has already been paid for, the car in front of you said, just to tell you that they love your church, they love that you're their pastor, and the meal's on them. And my thought was not, oh, that's so sweet, I should pay for the car behind me. My first thought was, should have ordered a milkshake. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Maybe a dozen cookies, I don't know, you still got their card, let's run it again, here we go. Right, come on with it. Um... But I love being in the right place at the right time. By the way, ask Amanda. I don't know where we're going to lunch today, but if you want to position me in the right time, right place, I, we wouldn't be opposed to it. Um, but listen, if you're Paul in this scenario, and your nephew has just heard what's going to ultimately lead to your destruction, do you want him to be passive, or do you want him to be proactive? Right? Do you want him just to sit back and keep it to himself? Well, it's none of my business. It doesn't affect me. I wasn't supposed to hear that. Or do you want him to step up and do something? Because see, if, if his nephew handles this situation like we often handle our interaction with non-Christians, ah, it's none of my business. Listen, they're just going to do what they're going to do. It's not up to me to tell them any different, right? Listen, if my house is on fire, I want you to show up and do something. I don't want you to just sit back and be like, well, it's not my house. If it was my house, I would, right? Get proactive. We don't sit back. We're not passive. And listen, I'll just, you guys are a great crowd, so I'm going today, right? I'll give you one more. Don't sit back and be like, I'll pray for them. <laughs> listen, pray for them. That's great. Power of prayer is amazing. I pray constantly. Like, it's a thing, right? But what happens is so often we allow prayer to be, uh, become our excuse for inactivity in our spiritual walk. Right? If Paul's nephew just prays for Paul in this scenario, Paul dies. Right? Listen, you've been praying for folks. You've got family. You've got friends that you've been praying for. That's fantastic. Keep praying for them. Now go and do something. Go and get them in an environment where they are going to meet and hear about Jesus. Right? Yes, pray. Yes, ask other people to pray. But what are you doing? Don't let prayer be your crutch. Don't let prayer be your excuse to be passive in your walk with God. Story goes on. Paul called to one of the centurions, and he said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell you. So he took him to the commander, and the centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring you this young man to you because he has something to tell you. And the commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside, and asked, What is it you want to tell me? Do you know how patient this young man has to be? He's just trying to get the word out, and he keeps getting drug around. Listen, that's the reality. If we're going to reach out, if we're going to invite people, if we're going to share the good news of Jesus with people, you're going to have to be patient. It's not invite them one time and then call it good, 
right? You're going to have to be patient. How patient, Dave? Because they keep screwing up. They keep saying no. They keep avoiding me. You've got to be just as patient as God is with you. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah, can't get one over on you, can we? Right? Verse 20, he said, Some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them. Because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. And the commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. Right? He's in the right place at the right time. And he takes the information to the right people. And then he leaves it up to God. Right? That's our call. That's what we're asked to do. Right? Because some of you, I know what the pushback is when we start talking about telling other people about Jesus and inviting them to church. You're like, well, I did that once. And nothing happened. I did that. Right? I got them here, and they heard a great message, and I was praying the whole time, and I was giving them the side eye, like, when are you going to respond? When are you going to respond? When are you going to respond? And they never moved. And so I failed, and I'm never doing it again. Listen, you didn't fail. Your job was to get the right information to the right people and leave the rest to God. That's what evangelism is. Evangelism is simply sharing the gospel message and leaving it up to God. Just putting it in. Now, I didn't say inviting them to church one time and then leaving it up to God. Right? There's action. I'm going to share the gospel. I'm going to share the story of Jesus. And if I can't do it, I'm going to get them to church because I know that this is an environment where they're going to hear it. Right? Our role of sharing the gospel, get them in places where they're hearing the message of God and then leave it up to God. Because you may just be a part of the equation. You may just be the beginning of their journey. You may be planting the seed. Somebody else may need to water it before God makes it grow. But your job is to get them there. You say, okay, Dave, well, how does this apply to me? Right? How does my progress, how do I make progress in my spiritual journey simply by reaching out, simply by inviting people into the presence of Jesus? Because when you, that first time, right? That first time when that person just receives Jesus, when, when they move from darkness to light, Right? When their life is changed, you become addicted. That's how I became a pastor. That's how I got into ministry right there. Summer camp, summer of 2000, I baptized Clay Yeldell in a pool in Petty John Springs Christian Camp right here in Oklahoma. And I've been addicted to life change ever since. Because when you experience that, when you're a part of somebody's story where they move from darkness into light... You want more of it. And listen, it's not always perfect, and it doesn't always work. And, but listen, I believe with all of my heart that we share this message with as many people as possible because the world is a better place with Jesus at the center of our lives. And it's not always easy, and it's not always carefree, but with Jesus at the center, we have hope, and we have joy, and we have peace. And I want that for every single one of you and every single person I meet. And that's why. That's how we grow. Because this young man was in the right place at the right time, because he stepped up and told the right people. Verse 23. Then he called two of the centurions and ordered them, Get ready. Get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at 9 tonight and provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. Paul went from being imprisoned and in chains to riding on a horse, right? His circumstances dramatically changed because somebody was in the right place at the right time. They took the information to the right people, and then they got out of the way. I love this. I love the idea, and that's, that's why we do what we do. That's, that's why, listen, that's why I am challenging you, right? This isn't just a preacher, hey, this is fun talk. I am challenging you. Do whatever it takes to get as many people as we can in this room for Easter. Why? Because we're going to tell them the message of hope. 
We're going to tell them the message of joy and peace and purpose in their life. This will be an environment. The worship is going to be, I was told, we've got some of what they in the biz call bangers, right? (laughs) The worship's going to be fantastic. The message, I promise it'll be a good one, right? Because we got a great staff that's going to help me get it there, right? Lives will change, but you've got to go. You've got to be in the right place at the right time. You've got to get the message to them. You've got to refuse to be passive and begin to be proactive. Listen, Gene Church, I believe we are in the right place at the right time. That never before in history have we had such an opportunity to impact the world for the kingdom of God. But we can't sit back and watch it. We can't watch everything go by. We can't sit back with excuses. We've got to get proactive and begin to move in God's direction. Listen, we've got to know that we are commissioned to be missionaries right where we live. That whatever neighborhood, whatever school, whatever work, that's where God has placed you because he has a purpose for you. He wants you to go and share, to reach out. That this is what he's called us to do. That we've got to be proactive. We've got to get out there. But listen, I'd be terrible... If I just said go and didn't give you some parameters, right? So as we kind of land this plane, there's three things I want you to keep in mind as you go and invite, as you go and reach out with the gospel message, as you go and do whatever it takes to get people here on Easter. Three things. You ready? And then we're done. Number one, they're nervous too, right? As nervous as you are about going and ask, they're nervous too. They're nervous because going to church is an emotional thing. Right? Especially if you've been out a while. Like, you don't know what to expect. You don't know what's going to be there. You do... So they're nervous too. Maybe because they've never been outside of a funeral, outside of a wedding. They've never actually been in a church service. And they're nervous about it. So it's okay. You can be nervous together. And just work through those things. Maybe they're nervous because they think they don't belong. That's some of your stories, right? You were told you didn't belong because the way you looked or the way you dressed, because of something that happened in your past or something that, that you had been carrying around. Listen, if somebody tells you, my life is messed up, I can't go, your response is, you should see our pastor. He's way more messed up than you are, right? And I'm okay with that because I am, right? Or they'll say, yeah, the roof will fall in. You ever heard that one? Oh, the roof will fall in if I walk in. Listen, I get it in our building, that's a legit fear, okay? <laughs> Two things. We'll give you a hard hat, and the work starts within days, fixing the outside of the building. So we're pretty excited about that. So we'll make sure that we secure the rafters first, all right? So you'll be safe. It'll be all right. They're nervous. Second thing, it's not their first time. A lot of people are coming back to church. A lot of you, that's your story, right? You walked away from church for whatever reason. Maybe there was some conflict. Maybe there was some hurt, some scars, some bruising. Maybe it was just life got busy and it wasn't anchored and you kind of drifted, but you chose to come back to Jinx Church, right? Maybe never been here before, but this is where you chose to connect back to a community. So we've got to be understanding that they've got some scars. They've got some baggage. We need to make sure we communicate that this is a safe place. It's okay to not be okay. You don't have to have it all together. You can come with questions. You can come skeptical. It's okay. We've got to remember that this is a safe place. Let me tell you a story that happened about a month or so ago. Uh, We were having a leadership team dinner uh, one Monday night. We'd ordered some pizza. The shepherds are here. The staff is here. I go out to meet the delivery lady. She looks at me and she goes, hey, I used to go to this church when I was a kid. This is where I learned that Jesus loves me. And I oftentimes kind of sidestep those things and the obligatory, oh, that's nice. But in that moment, God gave me the exact right thing to say. Because I looked her right in the eyes and I said, our message hasn't changed. Jesus still loves you. If you ever show up, if you ever come, that's what you'll hear. Listen, that's what we've got to let the world know. Not what we're against, not what we don't believe, not, right? Jesus loves you. 
And it's okay to come as you are. It's okay to walk in and be here. Last thing, just like VH1 behind the music, they think they know, but they have no idea. Right? Because it's true. How many times you walk around town? And they're like, oh, you're that church that believes. I don't know, do we? Right? Ah, you got you guys are a cult. No, we're not a cult. I mean, we kind of act like one sometimes, but no, we're not a cult. Right? We've got shirts that say we're not a cult, even. I don't know. Just come and see. Yeah, but listen, you guys are that building that looks abandoned. Y'all are probably a bunch of old people barely holding on, right? No life, not doing anything. Just come and see. See, they think they know. They've got all these misconceptions about what church will be, about what they'll expect when they come in. Or here's the one that just gets under my skin like no other. Well, I used to go to church there. Okay, so did half of Tulsa, apparently, right? But guess what? It's not the same as it was when you went here, so you need to come and see. You need to come and see. Because if they do, if they just get in this environment, it doesn't matter what they think they know. What they're going to hear is Jesus loves you. What they're going to hear is this is where it's okay to not be okay. What they're going to hear is this is where you can meet Jesus and have your life forever changed. So here's how we close today. We've got to move from passive to proactive. We've got to begin to do whatever it takes to stop sitting back and waiting for somebody else to do it from stop sitting back and hoping that it gets taken care of, that somebody else invites, somebody else says the right thing. We've got to get over our fears, get over our nerves, and we've got to do whatever it takes. We're not called to attend. We're not called to just show up. We're called to go and reach, go and tell, go and share. So we need to move from passive to proactive with our invitation. But here's the reality. There's some folks in the room. There's some folks watching online. You need to move from passive to proactive in your life. It's time to stop sitting back and just hoping Jesus changes things. You've got to stand up and embrace him. So that's what I ask you to do. I'm going to ask everybody in the room just to go ahead and stand up. And over the course of this prayer, over the course of this song, there'll be volunteers in the back. And what you need to do is you need to draw a line in the sand and make today the day that you stop just hoping the Holy Spirit filters into your life as you're surrounded by believers. And you need to become proactive. Take a step. What's your next step in your relationship with Jesus? Maybe it's step one. Maybe it's just receiving him. Maybe it's baptism and you've just been putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. Or maybe it's coming back, coming back to him. Heavenly Father, over these next few moments, God, I just pray that you will stir a spirit in us, in this place that refuses to let us stand still, that refuses to let us be idle and passive. But God, one that like you've done all throughout history, God, you move us. You put us where you need us. You empower us and embolden us in which we can go and make a difference in the world for your glory, for your name. God, I pray for anybody that has been passive in their life. God, that today would be the day. Today would be the day that they take one step in your direction. Listen, if that's you, Pause is long and awkward because if that's you, the Spirit's tugging. Don't just stand. Step out now. Step out in the song. Step out and ask for somebody to help you. And God, for those that are going to walk out of this place and you've placed on their hearts a name, a face, a family. God, make them proactive. Make them do whatever it takes to connect people to you. God, we love you. We thank you. And it's because of you we have hope. Because of you we have joy 
and peace. God, forgive us when we believe the deception that only leads to destruction. Let us choose life. God, we pray it all in your son's name.
we sing? Glory, glory, hallelujah, Jesus, you, you are good. Listen, if we had sang that when I was a kid, I'd have got saved like every week. Okay, hit that refrain, and woo, I'm in it. Uh, hey, I'm going to give you two cheat codes, two, that's two, two cheat codes before you leave, because who doesn't love a good cheat code? One, when you're playing the original Super Marios, you could have saved so much time, because when you died, if you hit start and A, you could start over at the level you died on. Oh, and you're like, that does me no good now. I've still got a Nintendo, it does me plenty good. Um, second thing is, if you want to be successful inviting people to church, Grab some invite cards. There are two ways to do it. One, grab 100 and do the shotgun approach where you just invite everybody. Somebody will show up. Or spend a lot of time investing in one somebody and make sure they're here. Either way works. We'd love to have it. Hey, you see how full the room is this week? It's going to be crazy on Easter, 9 a.m., 11 a.m. Kids stuff at both services. Make plans to be here. Have a great day. We'll see you next week at Jinx Church.